Felix here, good morning to you. We're going to discuss retail sales data. I know that's ex exceptionally exciting to most of you. You probably can't, can't really um, wait for the real details of this. So we're going to run through here the potential massive miss. Are we going to get a recession or not? And is this actually good or bad for our stock portfolios? Plus, we talk about the bond rally and everything else that's going on this morning, Neo data and Palantir announcement and much, much more. Put your questions in the chat uh, if you haven't already. And of course, make sure you sign up for the live trading training we're running next Tuesday. A thousand spots available. We just announced that you'd be the first ones there. And uh, they, they will run out of spots. We always do. And you get to basically understand my entire strategy, all of it. Um, what I learned as a hedge fund strategist and so on. And then we actually do some live trading together. So you can really see the strategy put into practice. Um, ask me a gazillion questions. It won't be on YouTube, but it'll be at phoenixfriends.org slash webinar next Tuesday, 11 a.m. Now, what's it all about? So we get retail sales data out here in um, in a little while. Um, uh, where is it? Economic calendar here. This is the data we're expecting. Consensus estimates are about a half a percentage point increase in retail sales months on months, if you exclude cars, 0.3%. That's the expectation. That's basically JP Morgan and Bloomberg and all those people who live in La La Land or you know whatever other land they live in. If you look at Bank of America's data, and why do I look at Bank of America's data? Because they've got credit card data. And they're saying total card spending, let me find a pen, um, per household as measured by their credit debit card data is down 0.2% year over year. Um, and card spending uh, per household also fell 0.2% uh, month over month. And we forecast a 0.2% decline in retail sales X autos figure for June and a 0.1% drop in the core group. That's X autos, gas, building materials, restaurants, basically nothing left. So they're saying it's going to come down 0.2%. So this is the big number here, the 0.2% down for X autos. Whereas the market is expecting that to actually go up by 0.4% or thereabouts. And that will have an impact. It will have a significant impact. And think about what it has an impact on. So what are people not spending money on? And then we'll run through a bit more of this data. Okay. People have stopped spending money on durable goods. So fridges, cars, televisions, that sort of stuff. Because A, they bought a lot of those during COVID. God knows why. And B, they're durable. They can last another year. You definitely don't need to buy a fridge, well, unless yours is you know, leaking. Um, and even then, a bucket will do the trick. Golden retriever will you know, lick it up anyway. Um, but they are still spending money on uh, essentially uh, services. So people want to have fun. But people are not wasting money on stuff that they don't necessarily desperately need. Now, this could be, if Bank of America is right, the biggest miss here since November last year and the second biggest miss in like two years. Now, have a look at what people are spending money on here. This is, again, Bank of America data on credit cards. And this is, in my view, the one of the most useful leading indicators that we've got out there is credit card data because those guys basically know exactly everything that's going on in the economy. And people are spending significantly less money on furniture. That's a miss. Home improvements, huge miss. Clothing, massive drop. Well, if you've got a pair of jeans, you've got a pair of jeans, right? Um, and travel, also down, which is kind of interesting. United reporting today, I think. I think today. Um, what they are spending money on is um, department stores, so having fun on little bits. Food is up a little bit, and that's pretty much it. And restaurants is flat, so that's kind of okay, right? But online retail also is still picking up a little bit. And again, that's generally people being cheap or just Amazon dominating the world. Uh, so I would not expect retail, the stale data to come in as optimistically as the market expects. And I've been saying for a couple of weeks now, be careful with non-discretionary, sorry, discretionary stocks. So stuff you don't have to buy, but you buy if you feel like it. Um, and definitely durables. Now, why is there no recession yet? Interest rates have come up 5%, the fastest rate ever. You don't even have had bank failures, bank runs, all sorts of stuff going on. You would think there would be a massive cataclysmic recession. This is why. The Biden administration 
is spending more money than anybody has ever spent in government. So this is pre-COVID levels. We were spending about, let me make that a straight line. We were spending about 4.5, I say we, obviously not my money, uh, your money if you're American, 4.5 trillion a year. In every 12 month period, the government is spending a maximum of 4.5 trillion. And, and this here already was the kind of excesses of the, the Trump era, right? So they were spending a lot of money. And Biden administration is up here at 6.7 trillion. So you're basically 50% up on expenditure compared to pre-COVID. And let's face it, there is no crisis. There is no uh, cataclysmic event we need to bail people out of. This just just an average Tuesday and they're spending 6.7 trillion over the last 12 months. Down a little bit from COVID levels, but not enough. Basically, we need to cut spending in high, uh, by 40% to get back to pre-COVID levels, which of course is never gonna happen because no elected politician is ever gonna commit suicide in public like that. But this is why there is no recession. It's the government single-handedly bailing out the economy, which is probably going to be not good for the economy in the long run. But uh, the sky is falling again. No, not quite. Because what I actually want to get to here is that this is actually good news for stocks, well, depending on what stocks you, you own. So what is it good news for? Well, it's good for tech. So if you are in tech or you invest in the QQQ or the SPY or something, you're basically 40% minimum in tech. So it's good for you. Now, if you are in, um, I don't know, Levi's jeans or Home Depot or something, then it probably isn't good for you. But it's really good for tech. Why is it good for tech? Because it'll signal to the Fed, again, lower interest rates are needed because we have a recession but for the government. So bonds are also going up significantly. Why do you get a bond rally? When, when do bonds go up in value? Bonds go up in value if interest rates are expected to fall. That's the way it works. And let's have a look at, have a look at the bond market here. Um, US 10 year, there we go. This is the US 10 year. It's up another 0.36% yesterday. It's up how much since early July? 3%. That's quite a lot. That is quite a lot for a US government bond. And it's sort of flirting here with that 50 day moving average, which is that yellow line there. Break through that, go through these long term averages, and uh, bond values, in my view, are going to shoot up pretty significantly. And anybody who's bought bonds in the last nine months is going to be celebrating, which is also why this trade is happening. So people are jumping on the bond bandwagon a little bit late, but it's also still driving the prices of bonds up. So yields down, bonds up. Uh, so this is the, 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 the yield chart here, um, which again, flirting with our 50-day moving average line here, 3.7 now. If you think about that, that's a 10-year yield. But let's look at the two-year one. So the U.S. two-year yield is, should be pretty much in line with where the Fed's going with interest rates, 4.7%. Interest rates are at 5 at the moment. They're going to go to 5.25 in a week. And the market's pricing in 4.7. So the market's already priced in two rate cuts, essentially. So the rate cuts, at least the market thinks, are coming. Um and the drug war says only 37 likes. Oh, dear. If we do something about that, that would be amazing. I appreciate that. Uh, you think we'd be in a recession if it wasn't for the BTFD program? I think you're right. I think there would be definitely be a recession without 50% extra government spending. And that's, you know, obviously makes up for a lot of retail spending disappearing. Plus, also, most Americans have been pumped full of stimulus money, right? I mean, there's still a lot of that floating around. 50% extra US dollars out there um, in currency. That's also done something uh, to people feeling more wealthy and therefore spending more money. So it's, it's all government. Basically, the US is uh, pretty much a communist country at this point. <laughs> I think that's the way it's heading. Uh, with the most effective and efficient stock market in the world. It sounds a bit like China, doesn't it? Yeah, it sounds a bit like China. Interesting. Uh, Andrea, good morning to you. Um, they're tearing down malls, um, Bodhi, which makes a lot of sense because retail is just dying. Why would you? Like, I literally, this morning, I wanted to order some toothpaste. What do I do? Go to Amazon, press buy. When is it going to come? Today. It's amazing, isn't it? Why would I bother to go to a shop to see if they have 
people in stock and come back and pay in queue. Like it's just not really necessary, is it? Um, good morning, everybody here. Let me know where you guys are tuning in from as well. Pop it in the chat. Um, do you think... Uh, Andrea says, Bank of America up 19%, and that's also what we wanted to look at, is earnings, of course. Let me just hit the refresh button here on mine. Um, hang on, hang on, hang on. There we go. So Bank of America here out, 88 cents is earnings per share we got. We were expecting 84, so that's a significant beat, 5% beat or something like that. I think your maths was slightly more accurate there. Can I highlight that? Apparently only in yellow. Green would be good. And... Revenue, also a beat. So that's a good number from them. Um, Bank of New York, Mellon, also a good beat, significant beat. Uh, those are all the numbers we got out so far. Mercantile Bank also beating, or oh, that's one of the sort of smaller ones. Uh, we're still waiting for Morgan Stanley here, Charles Schwab this morning. We're waiting in the afternoon for, and also this morning, Lockheed Martin. I haven't seen the numbers yet. So the big banks are benefiting because if you've been been alive, if you had a pulse uh, in the last six months and you had your money in a smaller regional bank, you would have been an absolute idiot not to move it to a large bank. What's a large bank? Well, Bank of America is a large bank. So you go there because you know they are going to get bailed out, right? They are definitely going to get bailed out. Or JP Morgan or one of those. I opened a JP Morgan bank account. Do you think Coinbase is due for a big pullback, says Billy Goat? Uh, appreciate the question coin it's not something i've ever invested in when they when they listed i thought the business was amazing they had like a hundred percent gross margin or something uh, but it's been too much tied to to bitcoin which is why I, I never actually bought it um this rally here is is obviously to do with that judgment it still looks good i mean from a technical point of view uh, and that's kind of my where my expertise with coinbase is is, is limited to you know this massive 24% day up and we are holding on to it. You know, we're not really losing any of it. So that's very positive. And that 0.2% up was um, on a day with decent volume, if you exclude these two massive days there, right? So that's actually quite positive. So yeah, I don't think there's anything really, really bad in this. Was anybody short this? Short volume is still 24%, seriously? Wow, okay. So people are starting to maybe really short this. So that could be interesting um, if that goes higher. Uh, that squeeze here was 27%, 23, collapsed here at 24. So it's kind of at a point where it's, it's yeah, it's going one way or the other, 24%. It's, it, it, it's, I'd say it's due for a big move rather than for a, um, for a collapse. We could also have a look in optionswatch.io, uh, which is a website we developed with a coin. And what you can also use this for, and, and appreciate this is a paid feature, but you can go and look at the expected move. So you can basically say, what's the market expecting by, by Friday? And it's expecting it to be in a range of, it's that blue range. So 68% so probability being in this blue range. And we could change it also to an 85% probability, which is a bit wider, um, and say, look, where is it expected to be? So between 90 and 120. So the market is expecting like a 10% plus move in either direction by the end of the week. So it tells you tells you something. And I think they're probably right on that. If you go out, say, a month, then, then it's expected to either go up $32 or down about $30. $30. So it's going to move a lot. And uh, could you trade that? Well, yeah, you could. I mean, you could do something like a long straddle, strangle thingy, where you basically, this isn't financial advice, guys, obviously just giving you an expert in, in, in a sort of idea of what one could do. You basically buy a, a call, you buy a put of the current share price. Uh, that costs you quite a lot of money, two and a half thousand dollars. So it's not definitely not for everybody. And then you would only make money if you go up to like 129 or 130, or if you went down to 280. Um, so you'd have to really think, well, it's gonna it's gonna really blow up one way or, or, or the other. So that'd be the sort of sort of thing you, you could do. Not you could maybe if you had an idea on direction, um, then sorry, I meant a long one. You could do also a long put butterflies. Say you think it's gonna go down a lot, then 
what you could do is hang on, you do something like this. If you thought it was going to come down, then if it moves down a bit to like 100, you make 200% profit. If it moves down further, you make 55. But you're taking a directional stance here. You're basically saying it's going to come down. It's a cheaper trade, $300, 200% potential profits. So, again, I, I, not something I would probably trade because it's too speculative for me, but if you had a strong view on coin, that'd be the kind of thing that you could potentially uh, do. Um, uh, Oliver, I don't have strong views on individual, on individual banks. Um, I mean, I think... Uh, Overall, there is an ETF, obviously, for it, and that's kind of what I what I look at more. I, I you'd have to really study the intricacies of loan books and, and things like that, um, uh, deposits, outflows of individual banks, and it's just not my sector. I I generally don't invest in banks because I I don't think banks understand their business, so I, I have very little chance of doing so because it's just too complicated. And there's always some trader or some department or some algo trader who's doing something that nobody really understands and they let them because they make money. So therefore I wouldn't really, but at the moment it's, you know, it's been, been very bullish since the beginning of the month, since sort of 7th of July here, but we're hitting that uh, 150 day moving average line coming down here. And uh, yeah, we're not really breaking through that, but at the moment it still looks quite bullish. So let, let, let's see when we get the little bank's earnings. Good morning, Carl. Has that done? I'd say generally in a period like this, people spend money on non-discretionary. Um, that's kind of what you would expect to do quite well. But I also still think that the big tech trade is, hasn't really gone away. Um, so I, I think that's also still going to be there for some time. Uh, US European bonds, same theory. It's just that interest rates will probably peak a little later. Um, so you need a little bit of a longer time frame. Um, I think the same applies to, to the Brits. Uh, thoughts about Tesla and this new Cybertruck. Well, they're finally going into production, but it's sort of like mini production, right? And I, you know what? I, I actually love the, love the fact that they have not prioritized this because they're delivering millions of vehicles off the car that people actually want to buy, that people can afford, that's it's a decent vehicle. Uh, I've driven plenty of Teslas, and that's where the business is. The Cybertruck is, to me, almost like a marketing gimmick at this point. And... Okay, they're putting it out there, but it's not what's going to impact the balance sheet or the, or the p &L sheet. So I like that they are not prioritizing it. I, I think it's a it's a side issue. Like Tesla is there with or without Cybertruck. Cybertruck isn't necessary for success. So they're going to make some, but not a lot. That's essentially what they said. Uh, do you primarily invest in indices or individual stocks? I'm a bit of a stock picker person. Um, I do a fair bit of it, though, through a, through a fund who, who I think do a very good job selecting stocks, um, which is a UK fund called Fundsmith Equity. Um, again, no, 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 no affiliation there whatsoever. I never I never take money for any recommendations or anything like that, by the way. So not a recommendation, obviously. You need to look at it in, in, in your own time. Um, I think it's a stock picker's market. If you're trading, it's definitely a stock picker's market. I think if you're buying also, because there are good companies at relatively reasonable valuations, and then there are rubbish companies at very high valuations. And... I don't think it makes sense to be in the rubbish ones. And I don't think it's that hard to stock pick. So I, that, that's what I what I do. Um, what about SoFi, says Dimitris? Um, well, we did a fair bit of SoFi coverage the last few days. Still looks, if you look at the stock chart here, looks lovely, right? Yesterday, nice green day, 4.4% up. Um, not breaking through the previous highs, really, though, or just a little bit here. So we need to get through that $10 line, which is the one up here, the top line there. But yeah, it looks very positive. I mean, yesterday in itself was arguably a buy signal because we exceeded the previous highs here. So again, I'm not saying you should ever buy it, but technically it looks very positive. There are 2 million pre-orders for the Cybertruck, allegedly. But have they put money down? You know, that's the question, right? So I, I think... Um, be careful with these numbers. It's a little bit like if you go to your friends and say, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about this great new business. I'm going to be making, I don't know, fluorescent mugs or something. Uh, would you buy them? And they go, yeah, of course. Love you. Amazing. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll get some. 
Uh, show up again a week later and go, here's the cup. It's $25, right? The response isn't going to be the same thing. <laughs> and they're going, oh, yeah, um, let me talk to it. Let me, oh, wait, I haven't got my wallet. You know, there are going to be lots of excuses. So that's kind of with these kind of pre-orders. Unless people have put down a non-refundable deposit, it's not an order. Um, hundred dollars refundable deposit. Yeah, that doesn't really get you anywhere, does it? That just means like um, you can tell your friends in the playground, oh, I, I put down an order for a cyber truck. It's a hundred dollars. You know what I mean? Uh, so, what's you be on the dollar of the current position on gold? Interesting. Uh, gladly have a look at that. So let's pop open a chart. Uh, when I trade gold, I tend to trade GLD ETF. Um, I'm a bit of a stock person. Obviously, you could also trade uh, some other instrument related to gold. Um, I don't, I mean, this doesn't look good, right? It's a. It's been falling, 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 falling. That little rally here, okay, the gap up was good, but we got stopped by the 50-day moving average line. Um, we are up a little bit pre-market. So right now we're actually above that yellow line, which is the 50-day moving average. Close above the 50-day moving average, and I'm interested potentially to change my mind. But at the moment, to me, this still looks bearish. Also, if we close above that, then that little maroonish sort of 150 day moving average might actually cross the 50. I don't know. I, I just, the gap up was good on big volume, but um, the question is, are we holding on to it? Uh, so early morning rally, yeah, true, but um, I don't know. And on the dollar, I, what's this? US dollar? No, DXY. I just typed in USD. <laughs> that doesn't work. A DXY. Uh, I think this is ever done, but that's just my opinion on it. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not a forex trade or anything like that. Uh, I do occasionally do options trades on DXY. Um, why do I think it's overdone? I just think, just if you think we're going to get a rate cut by March, and the dollar is down 3.6 percent on the basis of that seems a little bit excessive. I guess that's the way I look at it. I just think the reaction is probably a little overdone. Um, in the longer run, because the European and, and, and British interest rates will stay higher than the dollar ones likely, uh, it, it'll come down a bit, I think. But I just think the speed with which this correction happened is probably overdone. So I think we might see a bit of a kink up, but I, I'm, I'm not trading it at the moment because it's it's not really giving me anything. It's given us a floor here for three, four days, but it's not really giving me a anything bullish at this point. Um, lithium suppliers. So we have a chap in our community who's the absolute lithium mining expert. And really what I learned from him is you need to understand what they make, what the mine is, what the geography is, um, their permits, how long it takes them to get it out of the ground, the cost, uh, who the customers are, off-take agreements. There's a lot to this. It's, it's a lot more complex than investing in, say, Microsoft, you know. Uh, so you got to be careful with what they're getting out there. Is it is it is it the real lithium or is it you know what is it made for? Is it made from brine? Is it made from hard rock? Like you, you need to understand that. And I think that's that's really really important with that. Um, uh, Dan on Disney. Do we have a Disney trade open still? Yeah, we still do. Doing nicely um, at 50% of, of, of max profit here. Uh, so what was the trade? It was bearish. It was bearish. But it wasn't bearish from like, I think it's going to drop. It was bearish and it can go up another $10 and we're still good. Uh, why do I, I not love Disney? And I think when our earnings, we're going to get out of this before. We might get out of this today, actually, at 48%. Um, because I think Disney has many problems. I think many of those problems were actually covered up by COVID and the launch of Disney Plus, which I think is a great business. You spin that out, I'm with you. Um, but parks and all the indebted in filmmaking and all that stuff, like movies are incredibly risky. Like wh why? So at the moment, Disney is tanking. Um, that might also have to do with the strikes, obviously, in, in Hollywood. You know, Hollywood actors and writers are on strike. The world comes to an end. Isn't it dreadful? Um, honestly, who cares? Uh, so replace the whole lot with AI is what I say. So yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of Disney. And I think it's a, as a business, uh, an, an absolute wealth destroyer. I mean, go back, go back in time and, and, and 
they haven't really made anybody any money ever. I mean, they're trading at what, 2015 valuations, um, you know, or even 2014 valuations. So I, I just don't think it's a good business, honestly. I love the brand. I love some of their products, but I think it's a terrible business. And at the moment, it looks like a falling knife. So that's why I have a bearish trade open on it so I can make some money on that. Uh, Tesla earnings summer. I did a whole video on that yesterday. Uh, check it out. <laughs> uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, Cybertruck could be a huge asset. Well, I think what they're basically saying it's expensive to make, difficult to make, and I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure people are not going to necessarily pay the premium price tag for it. At least not a million and a half people, or, or two million, or whatever the the, the reservation is. Um, Uh, small space options watch. Yes, indeed. I, I, I have helped to create this. I still continue to uh, click on the guide in the top, top right there. And, um, it walks you, there are some walkthroughs, uh, that sort of set you up and walk you through pretty much all of it. Uh, if you have any other questions, of course, ping us a message as a contact us thing. There's even a live chat. So feel free to, to have a chat with us on, on that. Um, Hang on, let me just catch up here and then we go back. Robinhood lifted by Coinbase. Yes, because they are able to relist certain um, certain uh, crypto uh, coins, whatever you want to call them nowadays. So Hood, I am fundamentally, a, I hate Hood as a business. Uh, I think it's, it's the worst of Wall Street um, with its hedge fund backers. So I wouldn't use it. I wouldn't invest in it. Would I trade it? Possibly, yes. I don't really mind trading anything. Um, so yeah, it's been a been that uh, Coinbase decision essentially that's caused that that rally here. It went up for fourteen percent the same same day. So looking bullish from that perspective, struggling a little bit here. I think with the October twenty two two high, and um, that seems to be the resistance. But I haven't looked at this from an options point of view in, in a while. Um, Small space living, that's very kind of you. Um, thank you very much. That was really our intention is to like put it all in one place and make it just much easier uh, so that a, a non-technical person can put it, put together traits and search and scan. And it's a lot more coming. There's, there's a lot more in the offing in terms of ideas that we have that can make the experience even better. So I appreciate your kind uh, comments there. Um, uh, any other questions, guys? Please pop them in the chat here. If I missed any of yours, feel free to uh, repost them. Uh, don't be shy on that front. USB. Who's USB? US Bancorp. Um, I don't know. How big are they? 54 billion? No, I don't think that's a smaller regional bank. No, no, they're, they're a bit too big um, to be really worried about, I, I would say. Um, affected, yes, but I don't think, I don't think that's, a, from my perspective at least, not a threat. Um, Jan, you're very kind. As a short interest in NEO increased, I haven't had a look yet, to be honest with you. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Short interest. I mean, always take data with a pinch of salt. Uh, it's at 29%. Whoa, yeah, that's a lot. So it's typically 5%. It's at the moment at 29%. So that's pretty mass massive. So if you saw the delivery numbers today, 3,900 cars registered for insurance in the last week, that's pretty good. That's 8,000 so far this month. We're halfway through the month. Uh, a little bit more. I think it's up to the 17th, right? Um, that's pretty good. Right? So they're, they're sort of on track for that 15K delivery, which I think should be supportive. Market's up 1% pre-market here. And if they continue with that, then that would give us a nice squeeze up potentially. And again, that's not financial advice, but I think it could do. Uh, is there a situation where deflation could be beneficial or transitory? Uh, I love the word transitory, Dominic. Um, so what's the what's the fundamental problem with, with, with deflation? And before I forget, make sure you sign up for the live trading uh, training next Tuesday. Um, I'll give you my entire strategy. I'll explain it to you. I'll give you a workbook and we'll do some live trading together so you can exactly 
see what it's all about and 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 start to understand the market the, the way that I do, we do, banks do, um, and, and professional traders do. So check it out. It's free, webinar, but you do need to register for it. Um, deflation, okay, the fundamental problem with deflation is that if you think, okay, take the, take the cyber truck. So you, say you want to buy one, but you know next year it'll be cheaper. You're going to wait a year. If you know that the following year it'll be cheaper, you're probably going to wait a year again. And if it's going to be cheaper the following year again, you're going to wait again. So for three or four years, you haven't bought anything. You've just had that whatever the thing costs, uh, 50, 80, $100,000 sitting in a, in a cash account or in a bond or something, and you're not doing anything with it. You're not spending it. And you do the same thing with everything. And that's what happened to Japan. And, and I mean, I, I love Japan, amazing country, um, one of my favorite places in the world. But you will see a lot of things are like 30, 40, 50 years old, very well maintained, but they haven't been replaced. And that isn't really good for businesses, right? Because they make money out of the replacing. So... With deflation, maybe maintenance contracts is the thing to invest in. But yeah, people stop buying durable goods because they always get cheaper. And there's, there's this, this, this dilemma. Same with property. Imagine if your house gets cheaper every year. Like the price just fall and fall and fall and fall and fall. And people expect them to continue to fall. or well, they're never going to buy any property. There's a whole generation in Japan that's, that's grown up thinking it's idiotic to buy property. They just rent because it's cheaper. And they expect the property to keep falling in value. So it creates a, a, a real like disaster in terms of economic growth. And the people expect deflation, de deflation continues. And Japan has struggled to get out of this for like 20 plus years. So they still hardly have any inflation despite massive, massive stimulus. So it's a, no, I don't think there is anything good about it, honestly. I mean, for a period, when you, have, when you come from high inflation to low inflation, you could call that a deflationary movement, but I'm talking about negative inflation. It's a real bloody problem. Uh, thoughts on AMD Qualcomm, says HD. The, appreciate the, the questions, uh, AMD. Um, also, massive, massive short ratio, by the way, 30%. That's pretty significant. So this is all the AI rally, essentially. So it really comes down to your view on AI. A lot of this will come down to this set of earnings. Like, are they actually delivering on the very, very high expectations that we have for that? And Qualcomm will be basically exactly the same thing. It's um, not quite as exuberant, but a uh, similar story. Short volume is 12%. It's normally two. So it's still, people are broadly calling the bluff, but... Qualcomm has been declining for a long time, so I probably wouldn't hold that thing on the basis of that chart. Whereas um, AMD looks a, looks a lot more positive, right? That's actually a pretty pretty good setup here. But um, yeah, they get bumper earnings. I don't know when the earnings are soonish. Then oh, that was a week's chart, but you get the idea. Then um, that thing could actually squeeze higher. It could cause some serious pain to, to some hedge funds out there. How will the real tail collapse affect Palantir? Not, not a great deal, I wouldn't have thought. Um, Brett, you got some adverts to short Neo. Okay, I don't ever short anything. That's a really, really, really potentially pain, painful thing to do. Um, what are you bracing for? <laughs> okay, we can do a quick recap in a second here. A short interest on ride Q. What is ride Q? Right. Thing. Oh, that's Lordstown. What's the Q? I thought it was just ride. Um, yeah, no short data loading. I don't know why. I've got it. it. Does that sometimes? Sometimes you you don't get the data. Uh, oh, there it is. Um, it's not reported by Finra because it's an OTC. Hang on, let's just try ride on its own. Oh, is that because it's delisted, basically, right? Yeah. So there's no, there's no, um, there's no, um, no data on it. That's why. So sorry, can't tell you. Um, when the balancing, the rebalancing affects some stocks. Yes, it'll, it'll be a little bit of a, of, of a kick for the, for the big stocks. So the top seven stocks make up forty percent or forty-eight percent at the moment of the, of the index, and um, they will reduce that to probably forty percent. So if you think that through, that is about 20% less mutual fund tracking money and, and, and ETF money that track, you know, your QQQ, your SPYs. Uh, so it's the NASDAQ that's doing it, your QQQ particularly. Those, all those NASDAQ ETFs will have to chop allocation. 
They've done this though many, many times over the, the last decade or two, and it hasn't fundamentally um, reduced the appetite for those guys. So I think it's a little bit of a headwind. I mean, in a sense, it's probably priced in by this point because everybody knows about it or the fund managers know about it. You might still get a little bit of, of, a, of, of a dip, but I, I don't think it's the, um, I don't think it's sort of the kneecapping, if, if, if that's what you're thinking. Um, okay, guys, let me do a quick recap that I'll be started with for people who just uh, woke up and went, what the hell is going on? What's Felix on about? If you are just joining in, also make sure you sign up for the free trading training on Tuesday. I will give you my entire trading strategy. I will also live trade with you so we can learn the strategy. You can learn it with me together. And then we put it into practice. We do some real life trades so you can see exactly what it's about. Um, retail sales data to, to out today in 20 odd minutes or so, I think could be a massive miss. Um, the question then is therefore, are we getting a recession? Is this good or bad for our stocks? So let's have a quick look at what the expectations are. Essentially, we're expecting half a percent increase in retail sales. Uh, so minus auto is about 0.4 percent up. And I think that's wishful thinking. I think that's la la land thinking. Why do I think that? Because we have a little thing called the Bank of America credit card spending. So they look at credit card and debit card data. And we know from that earlier than most other data out there, whether or not consumers are still spending. And if you look at what are they spending? Well, they're not spending on furniture. They're not spending on home improvements, not on clothing, not on general merch and not on traveling. So the only thing that they're actually spending money on is department stores, 1% increase. Um, and that's pretty much it, groceries. Uh, so everything else is down. So we're looking here at, from what Bank of America is saying, a 0.2% increase in retail sales rather than the 0.5. And if you take the autos out, you take car sales out, it's actually negative, 0.2% drop versus an almost half a percent increase expected. And that'll be a bit of a slap in the face for, for retail stocks, for sure, especially for the kinds that sell durable goods, because you don't need to buy durable goods. You don't need another fridge, right? If yours is working, you've got two or three already. Um, but this could actually be good for stocks if you're in like tech or something like that. And that's because the recession keeps getting delayed by the corrupt morons in Washington because they have spent in the last 12 months $6.7 trillion on nonsense and waste and, and everything else. Whereas pre-COVID, even with this massive increase in spending here under, under you know, Trump and everybody, um, when did Trump come in? What was it, 18? Um, that was a pretty, but even before that, they were spending significant amounts of money here. Um, but even after all that, pre-COVID, the US was spending 4.5 trillion every 12 months, the government. Now, post-COVID, with no emergency around, it's 6.7 trillion, so almost 50% higher. And that's what's preventing the recession. And that's going to keep going, at least till 2024, and I don't see you guys electing someone who's going to say we're going to cut government spending by 50 percent because that's not very popular. Right. So this is likely to continue. And this like debt bubble is what's sustaining the U.S. economy. It's what's sustaining the labor market. And that's why the recession keeps getting pushed back or it's going to be a relatively mild one. What does it mean? Well, I actually think the softer retail sales data means the Fed is under less pressure to keep rates higher for longer, and therefore it is going to be good for tech stocks. So I think tech is still still the place to be. Thoughts on Live Nation? Um, interesting business that Live Nation. So Live Nation essentially are a tour promoter. They will. Um, pre-sell, they basically, they will pay a Taylor Swift a fee and then they will take the risk on the venues organization and they will set the ticket prices, I believe. So they make a nice margin on top. Um, decent business. People seem to be willing to pay a lot for live performances. Um, but it's, I don't know, it's not really like, 
it's just a margin business. You know what I mean? Like a middleman trader kind of thing. So I don't really see that as an amazing business. Yes, they're Live Nation. They've got great connections to all the acts and obviously they're trusted and they can organize stuff. And they've got probably contracts with stadiums and, and so on. But I don't know. It's just not really where I, I, I like to invest. I, I like to invest in companies that have a stickier repeat purchase. And this isn't really a repeat purchase. Like you're not going to go to Taylor Swift every week, are you? Well, maybe, maybe you do, but um, you know, you and your furry friends. <laughs> um, Andreas says, Life Nation also owns venues. Okay, that for me makes it slightly worse, probably, um, because again, that's a capital intensive business. And I don't know, I, to me, it just doesn't, doesn't really trigger in me the, the excitement to own it, but it might well be a great business. I mean, I thought the same about, um, what were those horrible plastic shoes? Um, not clogs, um, what are they called? With the 80% margin. I was like, what? Why is that rubbish? It's an amazing margin. So I, I, you need to look at the margins. That's really what it's all about. Um, Crocs, that's the one. Indeed, you guys know what I'm talking about. The ugliest shoes in the world with the most amazing profit margin. I didn't think that, I, I didn't think that was a business worth investing in. That would have been amazing. I mean, um, that's why sometimes you need to humble yourself with, well, um, let me show you the chart for Crocs. Let's go on a on a week's chart here so we can go out a little bit. He bought this a little while back. Let me get rid of the short interest. Is anyone shorting this? Yeah, actually, quite a lot. Um, look, they were trading at like seven, eight dollars in 2017, and now they're at 127. And they make plastic shoes that are the most hideous, fugly thing ever. Uh, so it is bizarre sometimes, but margin is amazing. It's, it's amazingly run business. And that's what I would look at Live Nation. I'd look at how well is this run? What are the margins? What's management? How consistent are they quarter on quarter? Uh, how did they survive COVID, for example? That's what I would, I would look at. Um, rubber shoes. Yes. It's not even rubber, is it? It's like synthetic plastic. It's just, just horrible. Um, I on I on Q there. Sorry, I, I jumped over that question a few times. Um, I don't have a strong or any real opinion on this, to be honest with you. I can have a look and tell you what the chart says to me, what the tea leaves say, but that's about it. So it looks like they had a really nice run up here. Couldn't possibly tell you why. Um, let me make this a bit bigger. Um, so buy signal basically here at 7.30. Do we have looked at this before? That, that green line there was a buy signal and now it's trading at double that. So it's been a nice run up. Anybody who traded this made a lot of money. Um, it's holding the rally. It's near the top end of it, but there's obviously some resistance at $15. Don't know why, why that is. Maybe it's options or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I just don't know anything fundamentally about the business. So I can't really tell you much more, but yeah, it looks, looks from a technical setup. looks very good. It's just, you've missed if you are not in this you've missed um a lot of the rally so that's what i always think like is this the place to buy it i don't know crocs make hey dude shoes i see i don't know anything about that um you wore crocs once um I'm not sure that's something you want to put on the internet, P. Morton. <laughs> um, no, obviously, they must be very comfortable or very good or something. Uh, otherwise, why would people keep keep buying them, right? Uh, if you haven't already signed up for the uh, live trading, even, even on this side of the screen, then then do on, on next Tuesday. I'll give you literally give away my entire trade trading strategy. You can ask me a gazillion questions and we'll do some live trading together. Felix Schwenz at org slash webinar that's on the 25th of july at 11 a.m new york time do you play biotechs i don't that's probably the one sector that i am well one burned by my first investment was biotechs which is you know it still stings and that was 1999 so that was not a good experience um my bank however made five percent on that nice to get screwed and I don't like the animal testing, to be honest with you. It's all animal testing. I just don't really like it. Like, I mean, I invest into tobacco and all sorts of stuff that I think is is, is rather um, unethical, but I don't really care because it makes me money. But somehow the animal testing thing really rankles me. So I, I don't touch, I don't touch um, anything biotech. Um,
Any last questions? Happy to take them. Um, otherwise, I'd say um, I'd love to see you live on Tuesday. It's not on YouTube, as I say, so it's a bit of a different format. Uh, the only other bits of data I think you should be aware of today is uh, NEO, 3,900 3, deliveries in the last week, which I think is pretty respectable. Um, Palantir's just got some interesting news out. I'm going to do some more digging on that. I might put out a video later on that. Um, they seem to me to become a gatekeeper to U.S. government business, uh, which is which is an interesting one. That's kind of what I was talking about yesterday. Was it yesterday? Um, they're sort of becoming the operating system. Um, they seem to be really be the operating system of the uh, U.S. government at this point, which is kind of cool. Uh, so. Uh, have you set up any earnings trades yet, Edwin? No, I was um, hoping to get onto the, that in about two hours or so. Um, and of course, you guys in the community will will see that. I'll ping it out to you. And um, Sneaker says, please volunteer. Cool, danke. <laughs> My pleasure. Um, and um, yeah, I'll have a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit, do a bit more research on that so I can put out a, a video that's actually well thought through. I appreciate you watching and tuning in. Smash the subscribe button if you haven't already. And, and Sign up and learn for free if you want to learn the entire strategy of hedge funds and investment bankers, not the dumb down for retail nonsense that, you know, we won't be doing any um, uh, covered calls or anything like that. Although, although that's a terrible thing to do. It's still a decent thing to do, but it's just not something that hedge funds would, would, would actually do. You've got five pairs of Hey Dudes. I, I still don't know what they are. I'm going to have to Google them. Um, thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. I hope to see you on the next one live tomorrow. Same time, same place.